You're listening to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. Visit our website for free resources to aid you in your pursuit of self-liberation. Old Vanu publications, podcasts, guest articles, and much more. Go to vanupodcast.com. And now, your hosts, Shane and Jason. And welcome to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. Shane here with a brief introduction to this special, uh, well, uh, introductory episode. This podcast is covered by BIPCOT, no government license, so has reuse and modification to anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. Uh, learn more by visiting BIPCOT.org. So today we begin a new series titled TAS, the Temporary Autonomous Zone. On this podcast, you'll hear the audio for uh, for that chapter from Akeem Bey's book, Taz, The Temporary Autonomous Zone, Ontological Anarchy, Poetic Terrorism. Uh, this was narrated by our friend Nick Irwin over at the Enemy of the State's Dank Podstash. Uh, so yes, shout out to him and big thanks for the help. I uh, certainly do appreciate it. Make sure to go check out his work. Uh, the website is thedankpodstash.com and uh, obviously uh, make sure to check out the podcast uh, as well. Next week, uh, Jason and I will officially introduce the series. Uh, Things like uh, the tentative episode list, uh, definitions, the history of Taz's, background on Akeem Bay, uh, etc. And I'll tell you what, guys, I'm looking at the outline right now, and while this won't be as long as the Crypto Anarchy series, uh, I think you're going to dig it. Uh, so please make sure to subscribe wherever you're listening to this podcast, and uh, check out the website, vanupodcast.com, for free Vanu books, show archives, free resources, uh, guest articles, and much more. Finally, please check out the, uh, the sponsor of this podcast, Liberty Intertact Publications. Uh, until further notice, every order placed at libertyintertact.com, regardless of the amount, will include a free paperback copy of Carrie Thornley's The Permanent Floating Voluntary Society. Again, that is libertyintertact.com. And if you're an author looking for publishing services, uh, we can help with that too. libertyintertact.com slash publish is where to go for more information or to schedule a free strategy call. I think that's all I have for now. Here's Nick Irwin reading The Temporary Autonomous Zone by Akeem Bay. The Temporary Autonomous Zone This time, however, I came as the victorious Dionysus, who will turn the world into a holiday. Not that I have much time. Nietzsche, from his last insane letter to Cosima Wagner. Pirate Utopias The sea rovers and corsairs of the 18th century created an information network that spanned the globe. Primitive and devoted primarily to grim business, the net nevertheless functioned admirably. Scattered throughout the net were islands, remote hideouts where ships could be watered and provisioned, booty traded for luxuries and necessities. Some of these islands supported intentional communities, whole mini-societies living consciously outside the law and determined to keep it up, even if only for a short but merry time. Some years ago, I looked through a lot of secondary material on piracy, hoping to find a study of these enclaves but it appeared as if no historian has yet found them worthy of analysis. William Burroughs has mentioned the subject, as did the late British anarchist Larry Law, but no systematic research has been carried out. I retreated to primary sources and constructed my own theory, some aspects of which will be discussed in this essay. I call the settlements Pirate Utopias. Recently, Bruce Sterling, one of the leading exponents of cyberpunk science fiction, published a near-future romance based on the assumption that the decay of political systems will lead to a decentralized proliferation of experiments in living. Giant, worker-owned corporations, independent enclaves devoted to data piracy, green social democrat enclaves, zero-work enclaves, anarchist liberated zones, etc. The information economy which supports this diversity is called the net. The enclaves, and the book's title, are Islands in the Net. The medieval assassins founded a state which consisted of a network of remote mountain valleys and castles, separated by thousands of miles, strategically invulnerable to invasion, connected by information flow of secret agents, at war with all governments, and devoted only to knowledge. Modern technology, culminating in the spy satellite, makes this kind of autonomy a romantic dream. No more pirate islands. In the future, the same technology, 
freed from all political control, could make possible an entire world of autonomous zones. But for now, the concept remains precisely science fiction, pure speculation. Are we who live in the present doomed never to experience autonomy, never to stand for one moment on a bit of land ruled only by freedom? Are we reduced either to nostalgia for the past or nostalgia for the future? Must we wait until the entire world is freed of political control before even one of us can claim to know freedom? Logic and emotion unite to condemn such a supposition. Reason demands that one cannot struggle for what one does not know, and the heart revolts at a universe so cruel as to visit such injustices on our generation alone of humankind. To say that I will not be free till all humans, or all sentient creatures, are free, is simply to cave in to a kind of nirvana stupor, to abdicate our humanity, to define ourselves as losers. I believe that by extrapolating from past and future stories about islands in the net, we may collect evidence to suggest that a certain kind of free enclave is not only possible in our time, but also existent. All my research and speculation has crystallized around the concept of the Temporary Autonomous Zone, hereafter abbreviated TAS. Despite its synthesizing force for my own thinking, however, I don't intend the TAS to be taken as more than an essay, attempt, a suggestion, almost a poetic fancy. Despite the occasional ranterish enthusiasm of my language, I am not trying to construct political dogma. In fact, I have deliberately refrained from defining the TAS. I circle around the subject, firing off exploratory beams. In the end, the TAS is almost self-explanatory. If the phrase became current, it would be understood without difficulty, understood in action. Waiting for the revolution. How is it that the world turned upside down always manages to right itself? Why does reaction always follow revolution like seasons in hell? Uprising, or the Latin form insurrection, are words used by historians to label failed revolutions, movements which do not match the expected curve, the consensus-approved trajectory. Revolution, reaction, betrayal, the founding of a stronger and even more oppressive state, the turning of the wheel, the return of history again and again to its highest form, jackboot on the face of humanity forever. By failing to follow this curve, the uprising suggests the possibility of a movement outside and beyond the Hegelian spiral of that progress, which is secretly nothing more than a vicious circle. Sergo, rise up. Surge, insurgo, rise up. Raise oneself up. A bootstrap operation. A goodbye to that wretched parody of the karmic round. Historical revolutionary futility. The slogan, revolution, has mutated from toxin to toxin, a malign pseudo-gnostic fate trap, a nightmare where no matter how we struggle, we never escape that evil aeon, that incubus of the state, one state after another, every heaven ruled by yet one more evil angel. If history is time as it claims to be, then the uprising is a moment that springs up and out of time, violates the law of history. If the state is history as it claims to be, then the insurrection is the forbidden moment, an unforgivable denial of the dialectic. Shimmying up the pole and out of the smoke hole, a shaman's maneuver carried out at an impossible angle to the universe. History says the revolution attains permanence, or at least duration, while the uprising is temporary. In this sense, an uprising is like a peak experience as opposed to the standard of ordinary consciousness and experience. Like festivals, uprisings cannot happen every day, otherwise they would not be non-ordinary, but such movements of the intensity give shape and meaning to the entirety of a life. The shaman returns, you can't stay up on the roof forever, but things have changed, shifts and integrations have occurred, a difference is made. You will argue that this is a council of despair. What of the anarchist dream, the stateless state, the commune, the autonomous zone with duration, a free society, a free culture? Are we to abandon that hope in return for some existentialist act gratuit? The point is not to change consciousness, but to change the world. I accept this as fair criticism. I'd make two rejoinders nevertheless. First, revolution has never yet resulted in achieving this dream. 
the vision comes to life in the moment of uprising. But as soon as the revolution triumphs and the state returns, the dream and the ideal are already betrayed. I have not given up hope or even expectation of change, but I distrust the word revolution. Second, even if we can replace the revolutionary approach with a concept of insurrection blossoming spontaneously into anarchist culture, our own particular historical situation is not propitious for such a vast undertaking. Absolutely nothing but a feudal martyrdom could possibly result now from a head-on collision with the terminal state, the mega-corporate information state, the empire of spectacle and simulation. Its guns are all pointed at us, while our meager weaponry finds nothing to aim at but a hysteresis, a rigid vacuity, a spook capable of smothering every spark in an ectoplasm of information, a society of capitulation ruled by the image of the cop and the absorbent eye of the TV screen. In short, we're not touting the Taz as an exclusive end in itself, replacing all other forms of organization tactics and goals. We recommended it because it can provide the quality of enhancement associated with the uprising without necessarily leading to violence and martyrdom. The Taz is like an uprising which does not engage directly with the state, a guerrilla operation which liberates an area of land, of time, of imagination, and then dissolves itself to reform elsewhere, else when, before the state can crush it. Because the state is concerned primarily with simulation rather than substance, the Taz can occupy these areas clandestinely and carry on its festal purposes for quite a while in relative peace. Perhaps certain small Tazes have lasted whole lifetimes because they went unnoticed, like hillbilly enclaves, because they never intersected with the spectacle, never appeared outside that real life which is invisible to the agents of simulation. Babylon takes its abstractions for realities. Precisely within this margin of error, the Taz can come into existence. Getting the Taz started may involve tactics of violence and defense, but its greatest strength lies in its invisibility. The state cannot recognize it because history has no definition of it. As soon as the Taz is named, represented, mediated, it must vanish, it will vanish, leaving behind it an empty husk, only to spring up again elsewhere, once again invisible because undefinable in terms of the spectacle. The Taz is thus a perfect tactic for an era in which the state is omnipresent and all-powerful, and yet simultaneously riddled with cracks and vacancies. And because the Taz is a microcosm of that anarchist dream of a free culture, I can think of no better tactic by which to work toward that goal while at the same time experiencing some of its benefits here and now. In sum, realism demands not only that we give up waiting for the revolution, but also that we give up wanting it. Uprising, yes, as often as possible and even at the risk of violence. The spasming of the simulated state will be spectacular, but in most cases the best and most radical tactic will be to refuse to engage in spectacular violence, to withdraw from the area of simulation, to disappear. The Taz is an encampment of guerrilla ontologists. Strike and run away. Keep moving the entire tribe, even if it's only data in the web. The Taz must be capable of defense, but both the strike and the defense should, if possible, evade the violence of the state, which is no longer a meaningful violence. The strike is made at structures of control, essentially at ideas. The defense is invisibility, a martial art, and invulnerability, an occult art within the martial arts. The nomadic war machine conquers without being noticed and moves on before the map can be adjusted. As to the future, only the autonomous can plan autonomy, organize for it, create it. It's a bootstrap operation. The first step is somewhat akin to Satori, the realization that the Taz begins with a simple act of realization. The Psychotopology of Everyday Life The concept of the Taz arises first out of a critique of revolution and an appreciation of the insurrection. The former labels the latter a failure, but for us, uprising represents a far more interesting possibility from the standard of a psychology of liberation than all successful revolutions of bourgeois, communist, fascist, etc. The second generating force behind the Taz springs from the historical development I call the closure of the map. 
the last bit of earth unclaimed by any nation-state was eaten up in 1899. Ours is the first century without terra incognita, without a frontier. Nationality is the highest principle of world governance. Not one speck of the rock in the South Seas can be left open. Not one remote valley. Not even the moon and planets. This is the apotheosis of territorial gangsterism. Not one square inch of earth goes unpoliced or untaxed in theory. The map is a political abstract grid, a gigantic con enforced by the carrot stick conditioning of the expert state, until for most of us the map becomes the territory, no longer Turtle Island, but the USA. And yet because the map is an abstraction, it cannot cover earth with one-to-one -one accuracy. Within the fractal complexities of actual geography, the map can see only dimensional grids. Hidden, enfolded immensities escape the measuring rod. The map is not accurate. The map cannot be accurate. So, revolution is closed, but insurgency is open. For the time being, we concentrate our force on temporary power surges, avoiding all entanglements with permanent solutions. And, the map is closed, but the autonomous zone is open. Metaphorically, it unfolds within the fractal dimensions invisible to the cartography of control. And here we should introduce the concept of psychotopology and topography as an alternative science to that of the state's surveying and map-making and psychic imperialism. Only psychotopography can draw one-to-one -one maps of reality because only the human mind provides sufficient complexity to model the real. But a one-to-one -one map cannot control its territory because it is virtually identical with its territory. It can only be used to suggest, in a sense, gesture towards certain features. We are looking for spaces, geographical, social, cultural, imaginal, with potential to flower as autonomous zones. And we are looking for times in which these spaces are relatively open, either through neglect on the part of the state, or because they have somehow escaped notice by the map makers, or for whatever reason. Psychotopology is the art of dowsing for potential tazes. The closures of revolution and of the map, however, are only the negative sources of the taz. Much remains to be said of its positive inspirations. Reaction alone cannot provide the energy needed to manifest a taz. An uprising must be for something as well. 1. First, we can speak of a natural anthropology of the taz. The nuclear family is the base unit of a consensus society, but not of the Taz. Families. How I hate them. The misers of love. Jide. The nuclear family, with its attendant oedipal miseries, appears to have been a Neolithic invention, a response to the agricultural revolution, with its imposed scarcity and its imposed hierarchy. The Paleolithic model is at once more primal and more radical. The band. The typical hunter-gatherer nomadic or semi-nomadic band consists of about 50 people. Within larger tribal societies, the band structure is fulfilled by clans within the tribe, or by sodalities, such as initiatic or secret societies, hunt or war societies, gender societies, children's republics, and so on. If the nuclear family is produced by scarcity and results in miserliness, the band is produced by abundance and results in prodigality. The family is closed by genetics, by the male's possession of women and children, by the hierarchic totality of agricultural and industrial society. The band is open, not to everyone of course, but to the affinity group, the initiates sworn to a bond of love. The band is not a part of a larger hierarchy, but rather part of a horizontal pattern of custom, extended kinship, contract and alliance, spiritual affinities, etc. American Indian society preserves certain aspects of this structure even now. In our own post-spectacular society of simulation, many forces are working, largely invisibly, to phase out the nuclear family and bring back the band. Breakdowns in the structure of work resonate in the shattered stability of the unit home and unit family. One's band nowadays includes friends, ex-spouses and lovers, people met at different jobs and powwows, affinity groups, special interest networks, male networks, etc. The nuclear family becomes more and more obviously a trap, a cultural sinkhole, an erotic secret implosion of split atoms, 
and the obvious counter strategy emerges spontaneously in the almost unconscious rediscovery of the more archaic and yet more post industrial possibility of the band. 2. The Taz as Festival. Stephen Pearl Andrews once offered, as an image of anarchist society, the dinner party, in which all structure of authority dissolves in conviviality and celebration. Here, we might also invoke Fourier and his concept of the senses as the basis of social becoming, touch rut and gastrosophy, and his paean to the neglected implications of smell and taste. The ancient concepts of Jubilee and Saturnalia originate in an intuition that certain events lie outside the scope of profane time, the measuring rod of the state and of history. These holidays literally occupied gaps in the calendar, intercalary intervals. By the Middle Ages, nearly a third of the year was given over to holidays. Perhaps the riots against calendar reform had less to do with the eleven lost days them with a sense that imperial science was conspiring to close up these gaps in the calendar, where the people's freedom had accumulated. A coup d'etat, a mapping of the year, a seizure of time itself, turning the organic cosmos into a clockwork universe, the death of the festival. Participants in insurrection invariably note its festive aspects, even in the midst of armed struggle, danger, and risk. The uprising is like a Saturnalia, which has slipped loose or been forced to vanish from its intercalary interval and is now at the liberty to pop up anywhere or when. Freed of time and place, it nevertheless possesses a nose for the ripeness of events and an affinity for the genius loci. The science of psychotopology indicates flows of forces and spots of power, to borrow occultist metaphors, which localize the Taz spatio-temporarily or at least help to define its relation to moment and locale. The media invite us to come celebrate the moments of your life with the spurious unification of commodity and spectacle, the famous non-event of pure representation. In response to this obscenity, we have, on the one hand, the spectrum of refusal chronicled by the situationists John Zerzan, Bob Black, and on the other hand, the emergence of a festal culture removed and even hidden from the would-be managers of our leisure. Fight for the right to party is in fact not a parody of the radical struggle, but a new manifestation of it, appropriate to an age which offers TVs and telephones as ways to reach out and touch other human beings, ways to be there. Pearl Andrews was right. The dinner party is already the seed of the new society taking shape within the shell of the old. The 60s style tribal gathering, the forest conclave of eco saboteurs, the idyllic Beltane and the neo pagans, anarchist conferences, gay fairy circles, Harlem rent parties of the 20s, nightclubs, banquets, old time libertarian picnics. We should realize that all these are already liberated zones of a sort or at least potential tazes, whether open only to a few friends, like a dinner party, or to thousands of celebrants, like a bee-in. The party is always open, because it is not ordered. It may be planned, but unless it happens, it's a failure. The element of spontaneity is crucial. The essence of the party, face to face, a group of humans synergize their efforts to realize mutual desires, whether for good food and cheer, dance, conversation, the arts of life, perhaps even for erotic pleasure, or to create a communal artwork, or to attain the very transport of bliss. In short, a union of egoists, as Stirner put it, in its simplest form, or else, in Kropotkin's terms, a basic biological drive to mutual aid. Here we should also mention Batel's economy of excess, and his theory of potlatch culture. 3. Vital in shaping Taz reality is the concept of psychic nomadism, or as we jokingly call it, rootless cosmopolitanism. Aspects of this phenomenon have been discussed by Deleuze and Guattari in Nomadology and the War Machine, by Leotard in Driftworks, and by various authors in the Oasis issue of Semiotext. We use the term psychic nomadism here rather than urban nomadism, nomadology, drift work, etc., simply in order to garner all these concepts into a single loose complex. 
to be studied in the light of the coming into being of the Taz. The death of God, in some ways a decentering of the entire European project, opened a multi-perspectived post-ideological worldview, able to move rootlessly from philosophy to tribal myth, from natural science to Taoism, able to see for the first time through eyes like some golden insects, each facet giving a view of an entirely other world. But this vision was attained at the expense of inhabiting an epoch where speed and commodity fetishism have created a tyrannical false unity which tends to blur all cultural diversity and individuality so that one place is as good as another. This paradox creates gypsies, psychic travelers driven by the desire of curiosity, wanderers with shallow loyalties, in fact disloyal to the European project, which has lost all its charm and vitality, not tied down to any particular time and place, in search of diversity and adventure. This description covers not only the X-class artists and intellectuals, but also migrant laborers, refugees, the homeless, tourists, the RV and mobile home culture, also people who travel via the net but may never leave their own rooms, or those like Thoreau who have traveled much in Concord. And finally, it includes everybody, all of us, living through our automobiles, our vacations, our TVs, books, movies, telephones, changing jobs, changing lifestyles, religions, diets, etc., etc. Psychic nomadism as a tactic, what Deleuze and Guattari metaphorically call the war machine, shifts the paradox from a passive to an active and perhaps even violent mode. God's last throes and deathbed rattles have been going on for such a long time, in the form of capitalism, fascism, and communism, for example, that there's still a lot of creative destruction to be carried out by post-Bakuninist, post-Nietzschean commandos, or Apaches, literally enemies, of the old consensus. These nomads practice the razia, they are corsairs, they are viruses, they have both need and desire for tazes, camps of black tents under the desert stars, interzones, hidden fortified oases along secret caravan routes, liberated bits of jungle and badland, no-go areas, black markets, and underground bazaars. These nomads chart their courses by strange stars, which might be luminous clusters of data in cyberspace, or perhaps hallucinations. Lay down a map of the land. Over that, set a map of political change. Over that, a map of the net, especially the counter-net, with its emphasis on clandestine information flow and logistics. And finally, overall, the one-to-one -one map of the creative imagination, aesthetics, values. The resultant grid comes to life, animated by unexpected eddies and surges of energy, coagulations of light, secret tunnels, surprises. The Net and the Web The next factor contributing to the Taz is so vast and ambiguous that it needs a section unto itself. We've spoken of the Net, which can be defined as the totality of all information and communication transfer. Some of these transfers are privileged and limited to various elites, which gives the net a hierarchic aspect. Other transactions are open to all, so the net has a horizontal or non-hierarchic aspect as well. Military and intelligence data are restricted, as are banking and currency information and the like. But for the most part, the telephone, the postal system, public data banks, etc., are accessible to everyone and anyone. Thus, within the net, there has begun to emerge a shadowy sort of counter-net, which we will call the web, as if the net were a fishing net, and the web were spider webs woven through the interstices and broken sections of the net. Generally, we'll use the term web to refer to the alternate horizontal open structure of info exchange, the non-hierarchic network, and reserve the term counter-net to indicate clandestine, illegal, and rebellious use of the web including actual data piracy and other forms of leeching off of the net itself. Net, web, and counternet are all part of the same whole pattern complex. They blur into each other at innumerable points. The terms are not meant to define areas, but to suggest tendencies. 
Digression. Before you condemn the web or counternet for its parasitism, which can never be a truly revolutionary force, ask yourself what production consists of in the age of simulation. What is the productive class? Perhaps you'll be forced to admit that these terms seem to have lost their meaning. In any case, the answers to such questions are so complex that the Taz tends to ignore them altogether and simply picks up what it can use. Culture is our nature, and we are the thieving magpies, or the hunter-gatherers of the world of Comtech. The present forms of the unofficial web are, one must suppose, still rather primitive. The marginal zine network, the BBS network, pirated software, hacking, phone freaking, some influence in print and radio, almost none in the other big media. No TV stations, no satellites, no fiber optics, no cable, etc., etc. However, the net itself presents a pattern of changing and evolution relations between subjects, users, and objects, data. The nature of these relations has been exhaustively explored, from McLuhan to Virilio. It would take pages and pages to prove what by now everyone knows. Rather than rehash it all, I am interested in asking how these evolving relations suggest modes of implementation for the TAS. The TAS has a temporary but actual location in time and a temporary but actual location in space. But it clearly must also have location in the web, and this location is of a different sort, not actual, but virtual, not immediate, but instantaneous. The web not only provides logistical support for the TAS, it also helps to bring it into being. Crudely speaking, one might say that the TAS exists in information space as well as in the real world. The web can compact a great deal of time, as data, into an infinitesimal space. We have noted that the TAS, because it is temporary, must necessarily lack some of the advantages of a freedom which experiences duration and more or less fixed locale. But the web can provide a kind of substitute for some of this duration and locale. It can inform the TAS from its inception, with vast amounts of compacted time and space which have been subtilized as data. At this moment in the evolution of the web, and considering our demands for the face-to-face -face and the sensual, we must consider the web primarily as a support system, capable of carrying information from one TAS to another, of defending the TAS, rendering it invisible or giving it teeth as the situation might demand. But more than that, if the Taz is a nomad camp, when the web helps provide the epics, songs, genealogies, and legends of the tribe, it provides the secret caravan routes and railing trails which make up the flow lines of tribal economy. It even contains some of the very roads they will follow, some of the very dreams they will experience as signs and portents. The web does not depend for its existence on any computer technology. Word of mouth, mail, the marginal zine network, phone trees, and the like already suffice to construct an information web work. The key is not the brand or level of tech provided, but the openness and horizontality of the structure. Nevertheless, the whole concept of the net implies the use of computers. In the sci-fi imagination, the net is headed for the condition of cyberspace, as in Tron or Neuromancer, and the pseudo-telepathy of virtual reality. As a cyberpunk fan, I can't help but envision reality hacking, playing a major role in the creation of Taz's. Like Gibson and Sterling, I am assuming that the official net will never succeed in shutting down the web or the counter net, that data piracy, unauthorized transmissions, and the free flow of information can never be frozen. In fact, as I understand it, chaos theory predicts that any universal control system is impossible. However, Leaving aside all mere speculation about the future, we must face a very serious question about the web and the tech it involves. The TAS desires above all to avoid mediation, to experience its existence as immediate. The very essence of the affair is breast to breast, as the Sufis say, or face to face. But, but, the very essence of the web is mediation. Machines here are our ambassadors. The flesh is irrelevant except as a terminal, with all the sinister connotations of the term. 
The Taz may perhaps best find its own space by wrapping its head around two seemingly contradictory attitudes towards high tech and its apotheosis, the net. One, what we might call the fifth estate neo paleolithic post situ ultra green position, which construes itself as a Luddite argument against the mediation and against the net. And two, the cyberpunk utopianists, futuro libertarians, reality hackers, and their allies who see the net as a step forward in evolution and who assume that any possible ill effects of mediation can be overcome, at least once we've liberated the means of production. The Taz agrees with the hackers because it wants to come into being, in part, through the net, even through the mediation of the net. But it also agrees with the Greens because it retains intense awareness of itself as body and feels only revulsion for cybernosis, the attempt to transcend the body through instantaneity and simulation. The Taz tends to view the tech and anti-tech dichotomy as misleading, like most dichotomies, in which apparent opposites turn out to be falsifications or even hallucinations caused by semantics. This is a way of saying that Taz wants to live in this world, not in the idea of another world, some visionary world born of false unification, all green or all metal, which can only be more pie in the sky by and by, or as Alice put it, jam yesterday or jam tomorrow, but never jam today. The Taz is utopian in the sense that it envisions an intensification of everyday life, or as the surrealists might have said, life's penetration by the marvelous. But it cannot be utopian in the actual meaning of the word, nowhere or no place, place. The Taz is somewhere. It lies at the intersection of many forces, like some pagan power spot at the junction of mysterious ley lines, visible to the adept in seemingly unrelated bits of terrain, landscape, flows of air, water, animals. But now the lines are not all etched in time and space. Some of them exist only within the web, even though they also intersect with real times and places. Perhaps some of the lines are non-ordinary in the sense that no convention for quantifying them exists. These lines might better be studied in the light of chaos science than of sociology, statistics, economics, etc. The patterns of force which bring the Taz into being have something in common with those chaotic, strange attractors which exist, so to speak, between the dimensions. The Taz by its very nature seizes every available means to realize itself. It will come to life whether in a cave or an L5 space city, but above all it will live, now or as soon as possible, in however suspect or ramshackle a form, spontaneously, without regard for ideology or even anti-ideology. It will also use the computer because the computer exists, but it will also use powers which are so completely unrelated to alienation or simulation that they guarantee a certain psychic paleolithism to the Taz, a primordial shamanic spirit which will infect even the net itself, the true meaning of cyberpunk as I read it. Because the Taz is an intensification, a surplus, an excess, a potlatch, life spending itself in living rather than merely surviving, that sniveling shibboleth of the 80s. It cannot be defined either by tech or anti-tech, it contradicts itself like a true despiser of hobgoblins, because it wills itself to be, at any cost, in damage to perfection, to the immobility of the final. In the Mandelbrot set, and its computer graphic realization we watch, in a fractal universe, maps which are embedded and in fact hidden within maps, within maps, etc., to the limits of computational power. What is it for, this map for which in a sense bears a one-to-one -one relation with fractal dimension? What can one do with it, other than admire its psychedelic elegance? If we were to imagine an information map, a cartographic projection of the net in its entirety, we would have to include in it the features of chaos, which have already begun to appear, for example, in the operations of complex parallel processing, telecommunications, transfers of electronic money, viruses, guerrilla hacking, and so on. Each of these areas of chaos could be represented by topographs similar to the Mandelbrot set, such that the peninsulas are embedded or hidden within the map, 
such that they seem to disappear. This writing, parts of which vanish, parts of which efface themselves, represents the very process by which the net is already compromised, incomplete to its own view, ultimately uncontrollable. In other words, the imset, or something like it, might prove to be useful in plotting, in all senses of the word, the emergence of the counternet as a chaotic process, a creative evolution in Prigogenes' term. If nothing else, the imset serves as a metaphor for a mapping of the Taz's interface with the net as a disappearance of information. Every catastrophe in the net is a node of power for the web, the counternet. The net will be damaged by chaos, while the web may thrive in it. Whether through simple data piracy, or else by a more complex development of actual rapport with chaos, the web hacker, the cybernetician of the Taz, will find ways to take advantage of perturbations, crashes, and breakdowns in the net, ways to make information out of entropy. As a bricoleur, a scavenger of information shards, smuggler, blackmailer, perhaps even cyber-terrorist, the Taz hacker will work for the evolution of clandestine fractal connections. These connections, and the different information that flows among and between them, will form power outlets for the coming into being of the Taz itself, as if one were to steal electricity from the energy monopoly to light an abandoned house for squatters. Thus the web, in order to produce situations conducive to the Taz, will parasitize the net. But we can also conceive of this strategy as an attempt to build towards the construction of an alternative and autonomous net, free and no longer parasitic, which will serve as the basis for a new society emerging from the shell of the old. The counternet and the Taz can be considered, practically speaking, as ends in themselves, but theoretically they can also be viewed as forms of struggle toward a different reality. Having said this, we must still admit to some qualms about computers, some still unanswered questions, especially about the personal computer. The story of computer networks, BBSs, and various other experiments in electro-democracy has so far been one of hobbyism for the most part. Many anarchists and libertarians have deep faith in the PC as a weapon of liberation and self-liberation, but no real gains to show, no palpable liberty. I have little interest in some hypothetical emergent entrepreneurial class of self-employed data and word processors who will soon be able to carry on a vast cottage industry or piecemeal shitwork for various corporations and bureaucracies. Moreover, it takes no ESP to foresee that this class will develop its underclass, a sort of lumpen yuppetariat, housewives, for example, who will provide their families with second incomes by turning their own homes into electro sweatshops, little work tyrannies where the boss is a computer network. Also, I am not impressed by the sort of information and services preferred by contemporary radical networks. Somewhere, one is told, there exists an information economy. Maybe so, but the info being traded over the alternative BBSs seems to consist entirely of chit-chat and techie talk. Is this an economy, or merely a pastime for enthusiasts? Okay, PCs have created yet another print revolution. Okay, marginal web works are evolving. Okay, I can now carry on six phone conversations at once. But what difference has this made in my ordinary life? Frankly, I already had plenty of data to enrich my perceptions, what with books, movies, TV, theater, telephones, the U.S. Postal Service, altered states of consciousness, and so on. Do I really need a PC in order to obtain yet more such data? You offer me secret information? Well, perhaps I'm tempted. But still, I demand marvelous secrets. Not just unlisted telephone numbers or the trivia of cops and politicians. Most of all, I want computers to provide me with information linked to real goods, the good things in life, as the IWW preamble puts it. And here, since I'm accusing the hackers and BBSers of irritating intellectual vagueness, I must myself descend from the Baroque clouds of theory and critique and explain what I mean by real goods. Let's say that for both political and personal reasons, I desire good food, better than I can obtain from capitalism. Unpolluted food, still blessed with strong and natural flavors. 
To complicate the game, imagine that the food I crave is illegal. Raw milk, perhaps, or the exquisite Cuban fruit meme, which cannot be imported fresh into the U.S. because its seed is hallucinogenic, or so I'm told. I am not a farmer. Let's pretend I'm an importer of rare perfumes and aphrodisiacs, and sharpen the play by assuming most of my stock is also illegal. Or maybe I only want to trade word processing services for organic turnips, but refuse to report the transaction to the IRS, as required by law, believe it or not. Or maybe I want to meet other humans for consensual but illegal acts of mutual pleasure. This has actually been tried, but all the hard sex BBSs have been busted, and what use is an underground with lousy security? In short, assume that I'm fed up with mere information. The ghost in the machine, according to you. Computers should already be quite capable of facilitating my desires for food, drugs, sex, tax evasion. So what's the matter? Why isn't it happening? The TAS has occurred, is occurring, and will occur, with or without the computer. But for the TAS to reach its full potential, it must become less a matter of spontaneous combustion and more a matter of islands in the net. The net, or rather the counter-net, assumes the promise of an integral aspect of the TAS, an addition that will multiply its potential, a quantum jump, odd how this expression has come to mean a big leap, in complexity and significance. The TAS must now exist within a world of pure space, the world of the senses. Liminal, even evanescent, the TAS must combine information and desire in order to fulfill its adventure, its happening, in order to fulfill itself to the borders of its destiny, to saturate itself with its own becoming. Perhaps the Neo-Paleolithic school are correct when they assert that all forms of alienation and mediation must be destroyed or abandoned before our goals can be realized. Or perhaps true anarchy will be realized only in outer space, as some futuro libertarians assert. But the Taz does not concern itself very much with was or will be. The Taz is interested in results, successful raids on consensus reality, breakthroughs into more intense and more abundant life. If the computer cannot be used in this project, then the computer will have to be overcome. My intuition, however, suggests that the counternet is already coming into being, perhaps already exists, but I cannot prove it. I've based the theory of the TAS, in large part, on this intuition. Of course, the web also involves non-computerized networks of exchange, such as Samzadat, the black market, etc. But the full potential of non-hierarchic information networking logically leads to the computer as the tool par excellence. Now I'm waiting for the hackers to prove I'm right, that my intuition is valid. Where are my turnips? Gone to Croatan. We have no desire to define the Taz or to elaborate dogmas about how it must be created. Our contention is rather that it has been created, will be created, and is being created. Therefore, it would prove more valuable and interesting to look at some Taz's past and present and to speculate about future manifestations by evoking a few prototypes we may be able to gauge the potential scope of the complex and perhaps even get a glimpse of an archetype. Rather than attempt any sort of encyclopedism, we'll adopt a scattershot technique, a mosaic of glimpses beginning quite arbitrarily with the 16th and 17th centuries and the settlement of the New World. The opening of the New World was conceived from the start as an occultist operation. The Magus John D., spiritual advisor to Elizabeth I., seems to have invented the concept of magical imperialism and infected an entire generation with it. Halkiot and Raleigh fell under his spell, and Raleigh used his connections with the School of Night, a cabal of advanced thinkers, aristocrats, and adepts, to further the causes of exploration, colonization, and map-making. The Tempest was a propaganda piece for the new ideology, and the Roanoke Colony was its first showcase experiment. The alchemical view of the New World associated it with Materia Prima, or Heil, the state of nature, innocence and all possibility, Virginia. 
a chaos or inchoateness which the adept would transmute into gold, that is, into spiritual perfection, as well as material abundance. But this alchemical vision is also informed in part by an actual fascination with the inchaot, a sneaking sympathy for it, a feeling of yearning for its formless form which took the symbol of the Indian for its focus, man in the state of nature, uncorrupted by government. Caliban, the wild man, is lodged like a virus in the very machine of occult imperialism. The forest, animal, humans are invested from the very start with the magic power of the marginal, despised and outcast. On the one hand, Caliban is ugly and nature a howling wilderness. On the other, Caliban is noble and unchained and nature an Eden. This split in European consciousness predates the romantic classical dichotomy. It's rooted in Renaissance high magic. The discovery of America, El Dorado, the fountain of youth, crystallized it, and it precipitated in actual schemes for colonization. We were taught in elementary school that the first settlements in Roanoke failed. The colonists disappeared, leaving behind them only the cryptic message, gone to Croatan. Later reports of gray-eyed Indians were dismissed as legend. What really happened, the textbook implied, was that the Indians massacred the defenseless settlers. However, Croatan was not some El Dorado. It was the name of a neighboring tribe of friendly Indians. Apparently, the settlement was simply moved back from the coast into the great dismal swamp and absorbed into the tribe, and the gray-eyed Indians were real. They're still there and they still call themselves Croatans. So, the very first colony in the New World chose to renounce its contract with Prospero, D. Raleigh, Empire, and go over to the wild men with Caliban. They dropped out. They became Indians, went native, opted for chaos over the appalling miseries of surfing for the plutocrats and intellectuals of London. As America came into being where once there had been Turtle Island, Croatan remained embedded in its collective psyche. Out beyond the frontier, the state of nature, i.e. no state, still prevailed, and within the consciousness of the settlers, the option of wildness always lurked. The temptation to give up on church, farm work, literacy, taxes, all the burdens of civilization, and go to Croatan in some way or another. Moreover, as the revolution in England was betrayed, first by Cromwell and then by Restoration, waves of Protestant radicals fled or were transported to the New World, which had now become a prison, a place of exile. Antinomians, familists, rogue Quakers, levelers, diggers, and ranters were now introduced to the occult shadow of wildness and rushed to embrace it. Anne Hutchinson and her friends were only the best known, i.e. the most upper class, of the antinomians, having had the bad luck to be caught up in Bay Colony politics, but a much more radical wing of the movement clearly existed. The incidents Hawthorne relates in The Maypole of Marymount are thoroughly historical. Apparently, the extremists had decided to renounce Christianity altogether and revert to paganism. If they had succeeded in uniting with their Indian allies, the result might have been an antinomian, Celtic, Algonquin, syncretic religion, a sort of 17th century North American Santeria. Secretarians were able to thrive better under the looser and more corrupt administrations in the Caribbean, where rival European interests had left many islands deserted or even unclaimed. Barbados and Jamaica in particular must have been settled by many extremists, and I believe that levelerish and ranterish influences contributed to the buccaneer utopia on Tortuga. Here for the first time, thanks to Esquimelin, we can study a successful New World prototaz in some depth. Fleeing from hideous benefits of imperialism, such as slavery, serfdom, racism, and intolerance, from the tortures of impressment and the living death of the plantations, the buccaneers adopted Indian ways, intermarried with the Caribs, accepted blacks and Spaniards as equals, rejected all nationality, elected their captains democratically, and reverted to the state of nature. 
Having declared themselves at war with all the world, they sailed forth to plunder under mutual contracts called articles, which were so egalitarian that every member received a full share, and the captain usually only one and a quarter or one and a half shares. Flogging and punishments were forbidden. Quarrels were settled by vote or by the code duello. It is simply wrong to brand the pirates as mere seagoing highwaymen or even proto-capitalists, as some historians have done. In a sense, they were social bandits, although their base communities were not traditional peasant societies but utopias created almost ex nihilo in terra cognita, enclaves of total liberty occupying empty spaces on the map. After the fall of Tortuga, the buccaneer ideal remained alive all through the golden age of piracy, 1660 to 1720, and resulted in land settlements in Belize, for example, which was founded by buccaneers. Then, as the scene shifted to Madagascar, an island still unclaimed by any imperial power and ruled only by a patchwork of native kings and chiefs, eager for pirate allies, the pirate utopia reached its highest form. Defoe's account of Captain Mission and the founding of Libertatia may be, as some historians claim, a literary hoax meant to propagandize for radical Whig theory. But it was embedded in the general history of the pirates, 1724-28, to most of which is still accepted as true and accurate. Moreover, the story of Captain Mission was not criticized when the book appeared and many old Madagascar hands still survived. They seemed to have believed it, no doubt because they had experienced pirate enclaves very much like Libertatia. Once again, rescued slaves, natives, and even traditional enemies such as the Portuguese were all invited to join as equals. Liberating slave ships was a major preoccupation. Land was held in common, and representatives elected for short terms. Booty shared. Doctrines of liberty were preached far more radical than even those of common sense. Libertatia hoped to endure, and Mission died in its defense. But most of the pirate utopias were meant to be temporary. In fact, the Corsairs' true republics were their ships, which sailed under articles. The shore enclaves usually had no law at all. The last classic example, Nassau in the Bahamas, a beachfront resort of shacks and tents devoted to wine, women, and probably boys too to judge by Burgess' sodomy and piracy, song, the pirates were inordinately fond of music and used to hire on bands for entire cruises, and wretched excess, vanished overnight when the British fleet appeared in the bay. Blackbeard and Calico Jack Rackham and his crew of pirate women moved on to wilder shores and nastier fates, while others meekly accepted the pardon and reformed. But the buccaneer tradition lasted, both in Madagascar where the mixed-blood children of the pirates begin to carve out kingdoms of their own, and in the Caribbean, where escaped slaves as well as mixed black, white, red groups were able to thrive in the mountains and backlands as Maroons. The Maroon community in Jamaica still retained a degree of autonomy, and many of the old folkways, when Zora Neale Hurston visited there in the 1920s, see Tell My Horse. The Maroons of Suriname still practice African paganism. Throughout the 18th century, North America also produced a number of dropout, tri-racial, isolate communities. This clinical-sounding term was invented by the eugenics movement, which produced the first scientific studies of these communities. Unfortunately, the science merely served as an excuse for hatred of racial mongrels and the poor, and the solution to the problem was usually forced sterilization. The nuclei invariably consisted of runway slaves and serfs, criminals, i.e. the very poor, prostitutes, i.e. white women who married non-whites, and members of various native tribes. In some cases, such as the Seminole and Cherokee, the traditional tribal structure absorbed the newcomers. In other cases, new tribes were formed. Thus, we have the Maroons of the Great Dismal Swamp, who persisted through the 18th and 19th centuries, adopting runaway slaves, functioning as a way station on the Underground Railway, and serving as a religious and ideological center for slave rebellions. The religion was hoodoo, a mixture of African, native, and Christian elements, 
and according to the historian H. Leeming Bay, the elders of the faith and the leaders of the great dismal maroons were known as the Seven Finger High Glister. The Ramapaws of northern New Jersey, incorrectly known as the Jackson Whites, present another romantic and archetypal genealogy. Freed slaves of the Dutch poltroons, various Delaware and Algonquin clans, the usual prostitutes, the Hessians, a catchphrase for lost British mercenaries, dropout loyalists, etc., and local bands of social bandits such as Claudius Smith's. An African Islamic origin is claimed by some of the groups, such as the Moors of Delaware and the Ben Ishmaels, who migrated from Kentucky to Ohio in the mid-18th centuries. The Ishmaels practiced polygamy, never drank alcohol, made their living as minstrels, intermarried with Indians, and adopted their customs, and were so devoted to nomadism that they built their houses on wheels. Their annual migration triangulated on the frontier towns with names like Mecca and Medina. In the 19th century, some of them espoused anarchist ideals, and they were targeted by the eugenicists for a particularly vicious program of salvation by extermination. Some of the earliest eugenic laws were passed in their honor. As a tribe, they disappeared in the 1920s, but probably swelled the ranks of early black Islamic sects, such as the Moorish Science Temple. I myself grew up on legends of the Calicox, of the nearby New Jersey Pine Barrens, and of course on Lovecraft, a rabid racist who was fascinated by the isolate communities. The legends turned out to be folk memories of the slanders of the eugenicists, whose U.S. headquarters were in Vineland, New Jersey, and who undertook the usual reforms against miscegenation and feeble-mindedness in the Barrens, including the publication of photographs of the Calicax, rudely and obviously retouched to make them look like monsters of misbreeding. The isolate communities, at least those which have retained their identity into the 20th century, consistently refuse to be absorbed into either mainstream culture or the black subculture into which modern sociologists prefer to categorize them. In the 1970s, inspired by the Native American Renaissance, a number of groups, including the Moors and the Rampas, applied to the BIA for recognition as Indian tribes. They received support from Native activists, but were refused official status. If they'd won, after all, it might have set a dangerous precedent for dropouts of all sorts, from white peyotists and hippies to black nationalists, Aryans, anarchists, and libertarians a reservation for anyone and everyone. The European project cannot recognize the existence of the wild man. Green chaos is still too much of a threat to the imperial dream of order. Essentially, the Moors and Ramapaz rejected the diachronic, or historical explanation of their origins in favor of synchronic, self-identity based on a myth of Indian adoption. Or to put it another way, they named themselves Indians, if everyone who wished to be an Indian could accomplish this by an act of self-naming, imagine what a departure to Croatan would take place. That old occult shadow still haunts the remnants of our forests, which, by the way, have greatly increased in the Northeast since the 18th and 19th century, as vast tracts of farmland return to scrub. Thoreau on his deathbed dreamed of the return of Indian forests, the return of the repressed. The Moors and the Ramapaz, of course, have good materialist reasons to think of themselves as Indians. After all, they have Indian ancestors. But if we view their self-naming in mythic as well as historical terms, we'll learn more of relevance to our quests for the Taz. Within tribal societies, there exist what some anthropologists call Manumbundin, totemic societies devoted to an identity with nature, in the act of shape-shifting, of becoming the totem animal, werewolves, jaguar shamans, leopard men, cat witches, etc. In the context of an entire colonial society, as Tossig points out in Shamanism, Colonialism, and the Wild Man, the shape-shifting power is seen as inhering in the native culture as a whole. Thus, the most repressed sector of the society acquires a paradoxical power through the myth of its occult knowledge, which is feared and desired by the colonist. 
Of course, the natives really do have certain occult knowledge, but in response to imperial perception of native culture as a kind of spiritual wilderness, the natives come to see themselves more and more consciously in that role. Even as they are marginalized, the margin takes on an aura of magic. Before the white man, they were simply tribes of people. Now they are guardians of nature, inhabitants of the state of nature. Finally, the colonist himself is seduced by this myth. Whenever an American wants to drop out or back into nature, invariably he becomes an Indian. The Massachusetts racial Democrats, spiritual descendants of the radical Protestants, who organized the Tea Party, and who literally believed that governments could be abolished, the whole Berkshire region declared itself in a state of nature, disguised themselves as Mohawks. Thus the colonists, who suddenly saw themselves marginalized vis-a-vis -vis the motherland, adopted the role of the marginalized natives, thereby, in a sense, seeking to participate in their occult power, their mythic radiance. From the mountain men to the Boy Scouts, the dream of becoming an Indian flows beneath myriad strands of American history, culture, and consciousness. The sexual imagery connected to tri-racial groups also bears out this hypothesis. Natives, of course, are always immoral, but racial renegades and dropouts must be downright polymorphous perverse. The buccaneers were buggers, the maroons and mountain men were misogynists, the jukes and calicacs indulged in fornication and incest, leading to mutations such as polydactyly. The children ran around naked and masturbated openly, etc., etc. Reverting to a state of nature, paradoxically seems to allow for the practice of every unnatural act, or so it would appear if we believe the Puritans and eugenicists. And since many people in repressed, moralistic, racist societies secretly desire exactly these licentious acts, they project them outwards, onto the marginalized, and thereby convince themselves that they themselves remain civilized and pure. And in fact, some marginalized communities do really reject consensus morality. The pirates certainly did. And no doubt actually act out some of civilization's repressed desires. Wouldn't you? Becoming wild is always an erotic act, an act of nakedness. Before leaving the subject of the tri-racial isolates, I'd like to recall Nietzsche's enthusiasm for race mixing. Impressed by the vigor and beauty of hybrid cultures, he offered miscegenation, not only as a solution to the problem of race, but also as the principle for a new humanity freed of ethnic and national chauvinism a precursor to the psychic nomad, perhaps. Nietzsche's dream still seems as remote now as it did to him. Chauvinism still rules okay. Mixed cultures remain submerged, but the autonomous zones of the Buccaneers and Maroons, Ishmaels and Moors, Rampanas and Kalakaks remain, or their stories remain, as indications of what Nietzsche may have called the will to power as disappearance. We must return to this theme. Music as an Organizational Principle Meanwhile, however, we turn to the history of classical anarchism in the light of the Taz concept. Before the closure of the map, a good deal of anti-authoritarian energy went into escapist communes such as modern times, the various phalanastries, and so on. Interestingly, some of them were not intended to last forever but only as long as the project proved fulfilling. By socialist or utopian standards, these experiments were failures, and therefore we know little about them. When escape beyond the frontier proved impossible, the era of revolutionary urban communes began in Europe. The communes of Paris, Lyons, and Marseille did not survive long enough to take on any characteristics of permanence, and one wonders if they were meant to. From our point of view, the chief matter of fascination is the spirit of the communes. During and after these years, anarchists took upon the practice of revolutionary nomadism, drifting from uprising to uprising, looking to keep alive in themselves the intensity of spirit they experienced in the moment of insurrection. In fact, certain anarchists of the Sternerite Nietzschean strain came to look on this activity as an end in itself, 
a way of always occupying an autonomous zone, the interzone, which opens up in the midst or wake of war and revolution. They declared that if any socialist revolution succeeded, they'd be the first to turn against it. Short of the universal anarchy, they had no intention of ever stopping. In Russia, in 1917, they greeted the Free Soviets with joy. This was their goal. But as soon as the Bolsheviks betrayed the revolution, the individualist anarchists were the first to go back on the warpath. After Kronstadt, of course, all anarchists condemned the Soviet Union, a contradiction in terms, and moved on in search of new insurrections. Makhno's Ukraine and anarchist Spain were meant to have duration, and despite the exigencies of continual war, both succeeded to a certain extent. Not that they lasted a long time, but they were successfully organized and could have persisted if not for outside aggression. Therefore, from among the experiments of the interwar period, I'll concentrate instead on the madcap Republic of Flume, which is much less well known and was not meant to endure. Gabriel de Anuzio, decadent poet, artist, musician, aesthet, womanizer, pioneer, daredevil, aeronautist, black magician, genius and cad, emerged from the World War I as a hero with a small army at his back and commanded the Arditi. At a loss for adventure, he decided to capture the city of Flume from Yugoslavia and give it to Italy. After a necromantic ceremony with his mistress in a cemetery in Venice, he set out to conquer Flume, and succeeded without any trouble to speak of. But Italy turned down his generous offer. The Prime Minister called him a fool. In a huff, D'Annunzio decided to declare independence and see how long he could get away with it. He and one of his anarchist friends wrote the Constitution, which declared music to be the central principle of the state. The Navy, made up of deserters and Milanese anarchist maritime unionists, named themselves the Uscochi, after the long-vanished pirates who once lived on local offshore islands and preyed on Venetian and Ottoman shipping. The modern Uscochi succeeded in some wild coups. Several rich Italian merchant vessels suddenly gave the Republic a future money in the coffers. Artists, bohemians, adventurers, anarchists, D'Annunzio corresponded with Malatesta, fugitives and stateless refugees, homosexuals, military dandies, the uniform was black with pirate skull and crossbones, later stolen by the SS, and crank reformers of every stripe, including Buddhists, theosophists, and Vedantists, begin to show up at Flume in droves. The party never stopped. Every morning, D'Annunzio read poetry and manifestos from his balcony. Every evening, a concert, then fireworks. This made up the entire activity of the government. Eighteen months later, when the wine and money had run out and the Italian fleet finally showed up and lobbed a few shells at the municipal palace, no one had the energy to resist. D'Annunzio, like many Italian anarchists, later veered toward fascism. In fact, Mussolini, the ex-syndicalist, himself seduced the poet along that route. By the time D'Annunzio realized his error, it was too late. He was too old and sick. But Il Duce had him killed anyway pushed off a balcony, and turned him into a martyr. As for Flume, though it lacked the seriousness of the free Ukraine or Barcelona, it can probably teach us more about certain aspects of our quest. It was in some ways the last of the pirate utopias, or the only modern example. In other ways, perhaps it was very nearly the first modern Taz. I believe that if we compare Flume with the Paris Uprising of 1968, also the Italian urban insurrections of the early 70s, as well as the American counterculture communes and their anarcho-New Left influences, we should notice certain similarities, such as the importance of aesthetic theory, the situationists, also what might be called pirate economics, living high off the surplus of social overproduction, even the popularity of colorful military uniforms, and the concept of music as revolutionary social change. And finally, their shared air of impermanence, of being ready to move on, shapeshift, relocate to other universities, mountaintops, ghettos, factories, safe houses, abandoned farms, or even other planes of reality. 
No one was trying to impose yet another revolutionary dictatorship, either at Flume, Paris, or Millbrook. Either the world would change or it wouldn't. Meanwhile, keep on the move and live intensely. The Munich Soviet, or Council Republic of 1919, exhibited certain features of the Taz, even though, like most revolutions, its stated goals were not exactly temporary. Gustave Landour's participation as Minister of Culture, along with Silvio Giselle as Minister of Economics, and other anti-authoritarian and extreme libertarian socialists, such as the poet and playwrights Eric Masham and Ernst Toller, and Rhett Maru, the novelist B. Traven, gave the Soviet a distinct anarchist flavor. Landauer, who had spent years of isolation working on his grand synthesis of Nietzsche, Proudhon, Kropotkin, Stirner, Meister, Eckhart, the radical mystics, and the romantic Volk philosophers, knew from the start that the Soviet was doomed. He hoped only that it would last long enough to be understood. Kurt Eisner, the martyred founder of the Soviet, believed quite literally that poets and poetry should form the basis of the revolution. Plans were launched to devote a large piece of Bavaria to an experiment in anarcho-socialist economy and community. Landur drew up proposals for a free school system and a people's theater. Support for the Soviet was more or less confined to the poorest working class and bohemian neighborhoods of Munich, and to groups like the Wandervogel, the neo-romantic youth movement, Jewish radicals like Buber, the expressionists, and other marginals. Thus, historians dismiss it as the coffeehouse republic and belittle its significance in comparison with Marxist and Spartacist participation in Germany's post-war revolutions. Outmaneuvered by the communists and eventually murdered by soldiers under the influence of the occult and fascist tool society, Landur deserves to be remembered as a saint. Yet even anarchists nowadays tend to misunderstand and condemn him for selling out to a socialist government. If the Soviet had lasted even a year, we would weep at the mention of its beauty. But before even the first flowers of that spring had wilted, the geist and the spirit of poetry were crushed, and we have forgotten. Imagine what it must have been to breathe the air of a city in which the Minister of Culture has just predicted that school children will soon be memorizing the works of Walt Whitman. Ah, for a time machine. The Will to Power as Disappearance Foucault, Baudrillard, and others have discussed various modes of disappearance at great length. Here I wish to suggest that Taz is in some sense a tactic of disappearance. When the theorists speak of the disappearance of the social, they mean in part the impossibility of the social revolution and in part the impossibility of the state. The Abyss of Power, the End of the Discourse of Power The anarchist question in this case should be then, why bother to confront a power which has lost all meaning and become sheer simulation? Such confrontations will only result in dangerous and ugly spasms of violence by the empty-headed shit-for-brains who've inherited the keys to all the armories and prisons. Perhaps this is a crude American misunderstanding of sublime and subtle Franco-Germanic theory. If so, fine. Whoever said understanding was needed to make use of an idea? As I read it, disappearance seems to be a very logical, radical option for our time, not at all a disaster or death from the radical project. Unlike the morbid death-freak nihilistic interpretation of theory, mine intends to mine it for useful strategies in the always ongoing revolution of everyday life, the struggle that cannot cease even with the last failure of political or social revolution, because nothing except the end of the world can bring an end to everyday life, nor to our aspirations for the good things, for the marvelous. And as Nietzsche said, if the world could come to an end, logically it would have done so. It has not, so it does not. And so, as one of the Sufis said, no matter how many drafts of forbidden wine we drink, we will carry this raging thirst into eternity. Zerzan and Black have independently noted certain elements of refusal, Zerzan's term, which perhaps can be seen as somehow symptomatic of a radical culture of disappearance. Partly unconscious, but partly conscience, 
which influences far more people than any leftist or anarchist idea. These gestures are made against institutions, and in that sense are negative. But each negative gesture also suggests a positive tactic to replace rather than merely refuse the despised institution. For example, the negative gesture against schooling is voluntary illiteracy. Since I do not share the liberal worship of literacy for the sake of social ameliorization, I cannot quite share the gasps of dismay heard everywhere at this phenomenon. I sympathize with children who refuse books along with the garbage in the books. There are, however, positive alternatives which can make use of the same energy of disappearance. Homeschooling and craft apprenticeship, like truancy, result in an absence from the prison of school. Hacking is another form of education with certain features of invisibility. A mass-scale negative gesture against politics consists simply of not voting. Apathy, i.e. a healthy boredom with the weary spectacle, keeps over half the nation from the polls. Anarchism never accomplished as much. Nor did anarchism have anything to do with the failure of the recent census. Again, there are positive parallels. Networking as an alternative to politics is practiced at many levels of society, and non-hierarchic organization has attained popularity even outside the anarchist movement, simply because it works. Act Up and Earth First are two examples. Alcoholics Anonymous, oddly enough, is another. Refusal of work can take the forms of absenteeism, on-job drunkenness, sabotage, and sheer inattention, but it can also give rise to new modes of rebellion, more self-employment, participation in the black economy in Lavoro Nero, welfare scams and other criminal options, pot farming, etc., all more or less invisible activities compared to traditional leftist confrontational tactics such as the general strike. Refusal of the church? Well, the negative gesture here probably consists of watching television. But the positive alternatives include all sorts of non-authoritarian forms of spirituality, from unchurched Christianity to neo-paganism. The free religions, as I like to call them, small, self-created, half-serious, half-fun cults influenced by such currents as Discordianism and Anarcho-Daoism are to be found all over marginal America and provide a growing fourth way outside the mainstream churches, the tele-evangelical bigots, and New Age vapidity and consumerism. It might also be said that the chief refusal of orthodoxy consists of the construction of private moralities in the Nietzschean sense, the spirituality of free spirits. The negative refusal of home is homelessness, which most consider a form of victimization, not wishing to be forced into nomadology. But homelessness can in a sense be a virtue, an adventure, so it appears, at least, to the huge international movement of the squatters, our modern hobos. The negative refusal of the family is clearly divorce, or some other symptom of breakdown. The positive alternative springs from the realization that life can be happier without the nuclear family, whereupon a hundred flowers bloom, from single parentage to group marriage to erotic affinity group. The European project fights a major rearguard action in defense of the family. Oedipal misery lies at the heart of control. Alternatives exist, but they must remain in hiding, especially since the war against sex of the 1980s and 1990s. What is the refusal of art? The negative gesture is not to be found in the silly nihilism of an art strike or the defacing of some famous painting. It is to be seen in the almost universal glassy-eyed boredom that creeps over most people at the very mention of the word. But what would the positive gesture consist of? Is it possible to imagine an aesthetics that does not engage, that removes itself from history and even from the market, or at least tends to do so? which wants to replace representation with presence. How does presence make itself felt even in or through representation? Chaos linguistics traces a presence which is continually disappearing from all orderings of language and meaning systems. An elusive presence, evanescent, latif, subtle, a term in Sulfi alchemy. The strange attractor around which memes accrue chaotically forming a new and spontaneous order. 
Here we have an aesthetics of the borderland between chaos and order, the margin, the area of catastrophe, where the breakdown of the system can equal enlightenment. Note, for an explanation of chaos linguistics, see Appendix A, then please read this paragraph again. The disappearance of the artist is the suppression and realization of art in situationist terms. But from where do we vanish? And are we ever seen or heard from again? We go to Croatan. What's our fate? All our art consists of a goodbye note to history. Gone to Croatan. But where is it? And what will we do there? First, we're not talking here about literally vanishing from the world and its future. No escape backward in time to Paleolithic original leisure society. No forever utopia. No back mountain hideaway. No island. Also, no post-revolutionary utopia. Most likely no revolution at all. Also, no Vanu. No anarchist space stations. Nor do we accept a Baudrillardian disappearance into the silence of an ironic hyperconformity. I have no quarrel with any Rimbods who escape art for whatever absentia they can find. But we can't build an aesthetics, even an aesthetics of disappearance, on the simple act of never coming back. By saying we're not avant-garde, and that there is no avant-garde, we've written our gone to Croatan. The question then becomes, how to envision everyday life in Croatan? Particularly if we cannot say that Croatan exists in time, Stone Age or post-revolution, or space, either as utopia or as some forgotten Midwestern town or Abyssinia. Where and when is the world of unmediated creativity? If it can exist, it does exist, but perhaps only as a sort of alternate reality which we so far have not learned to perceive. Where would we look for the seeds, the weeds cracking through our sidewalks? From this other world into our world. The clues, the right directions for searching, a finger pointing at the moon, I believe, or would at least like to propose, that the only solution to the suppression and realization of art lies in the emergence of the Taz. I would strongly reject the criticism that the Taz itself is nothing but a work of art, although it may have some of the trappings. I do suggest that the Taz is the only possible time and place for art to happen for the sheer pleasure of creative play, and as an actual contribution to the forces which allow the Taz to cohere and manifest. Art in the world of art has become a commodity, but deeper than that lies the problem of representation itself and the refusal of all mediation. In the Taz, art as a commodity will simply become impossible. It will instead be a condition of life. Mediation is harder to overcome, but the removal of all barriers between artists and users of art will tend toward a condition in which, as A.K. Kumaraswamy described it, the artist is not a special sort of person, but every person is a special sort of artist. In sum, disappearance is not necessarily a catastrophe, except in the mathematical sense of a sudden topological change. All the positive gestures sketched here seem to involve various degrees of invisibility rather than traditional revolutionary confrontation. The new left never really believed in its own existence till it saw itself on the evening news. The new autonomy, by contrast, will either infiltrate the media and subvert it from within, or else never be seen at all. The Taz exists not only beyond control, but also beyond definition, beyond gazing and naming as acts of enslaving, beyond the understanding of the state, beyond the state's ability to see. Rat Holes in the Babylon of Information the Taz as a conscious radical tactic will emerge under certain conditions. 1. Psychological liberation. That is, we must realize, make real, the moments and spaces in which freedom is not only possible but actual. We must know in what ways we are genuinely oppressed, and also in what ways we are self-repressed or ensnared in a fantasy in which ideas oppress us. Work for example, is a far more actual source of misery for most of us than legislative politics. 
Alienation is far more dangerous for us than toothless, outdated, dying ideologies. Mental addiction to ideals, which in fact turn out to be mere projections of our resentment and sensations of victimization, will never further our project. The Taz is not a harbinger of some pie-in-the-sky social utopia to which we must sacrifice our lives that our children's children may breathe a bit of free air. The Taz must be the scene of our present autonomy, but it can only exist on the condition that we already know ourselves as free beings. 2. The counternet must expand. At present, it reflects more abstraction than actuality. Zines and BBSs exchange information, which is part of the necessary groundwork of the TAS. But very little of this information relates to concrete goods and services necessary for the autonomous life. We do not live in cyberspace. To dream that we do is to fall into cybernosis, the false transcendence of the body. The TAS is a physical place, and we are either in it or not. All the senses must be involved. The web is like a new sense in some ways, but it must be added to the others. The others must not be subtracted from it, as in some horrible parody of the mystic trance. Without the web, the full realization of the Taz complex would be impossible. But the web is not the end in itself. It's a weapon. 3. The apparatus of control, the state, must, or so we must assume, continue to deliquesce and petrify simultaneously, must progress on its present course in which hysterical rigidity comes more and more to mask of vacuity, an abyss of power. As power disappears, our will to power must be disappearance. We've already dealt with the question of whether the Taz can be viewed merely as a work of art, but you will also demand to know whether it is more than a poor rat hole in the Babylon of information or rather, a maze of tunnels, more and more connected, but devoted only to the economic dead end of piratical parasitism. I'll answer that I'd rather be a rat in the wall than a rat in the cage, but I'll also insist that the Taz transcends these categories. A world in which the Taz succeeded in putting down roots might resemble the world envisioned by P.M. in his fantasy novel Bolo Bolo. Perhaps the Taz is a proto-bolo. But inasmuch as the Taz exists now, it stands for much more than the mundanity of negativity or countercultural dropoutism. We've mentioned the festal aspect of the movement, which is uncontrolled, and which adheres in spontaneous self-ordering, however brief. It is epiphanic, a peak experience on the social as well as individual scale. Liberation is realized a struggle. This is the essence of Nietzsche's self-overcoming. The present thesis might also take for a sign Nietzsche's wandering. It is the precursor of the drift, in the C2 sense of the derive, and Leotard's definition of drift work. We can foresee a whole new geography, a kind of pilgrimage map in which holy sites are replaced by peak experiences and tazes, a real science of psychotopography, perhaps to be called geo-autonomy or anarchomancy. The Taz involves a kind of ferality, a growth from tameness to wilderness, a return which is also a step forward. It also demands a yoga of chaos, a project of higher orderings, of consciousness or simply of life, which are approached by surfing the wavefront of chaos, of complex dynamism. The Taz is an art of life and continual rising up, wild but gentle, a seducer, not a rapist, a smuggler rather than a bloody pirate, a dancer, not an eschatologist. Let us admit that we have intended parties where for one brief night a republic of gratified desires was attained. Shall we not confess that the politics of that night have more reality and force for us than those of, say, the entire U.S. government? Some of the parties we've mentioned lasted for two or three years. Is this something worth imagining, worth fighting for? Let us study invisibility, webworking, psychic nomadism, and who knows what we might attain. Spring Equinox, 1990